Hello, Shelter Rock Church, Pastor Steve here. And we're gonna start this message a little differently than we would normally. I'm going to invite my wife, Michelle, if you can come on over here for a moment. And we're going to pray out loud together. Now here's what I'd love for you to do. We're gonna pray the Lord's Prayer, sometimes called the Our Father. And as we pray it out loud, I hope that you will too. And if you're with a family or a friend, pray it out loud together. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. For forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Michelle is just returning from having gone scuba diving, and so I appreciate her coming to the church. There was a reason why I wanted us to pray together. It's because the prayer we're looking at begins this way. Our Father. It is something done in the plural. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. We're continuing our message series, Teach Us to Pray. We began it last week as we were introduced to how we even ended up going through this section of scripture. In the book of Luke, where it occurs on Luke chapter 11, what we find out is that Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray in response to their question. Lord, teach us to pray. But in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is actually including this prayer in response to the sermon that he is giving to a larger group of people. And the Matthew version is a little longer. So scholars have speculated why the Luke version of the prayer is a little shorter and the Matthew version a little longer. And it probably has a lot to do with the setting in which it was given. And so the prayer begins with an introductory statement, and then it consists of six petitions. And I have the privilege of teaching today on the first statement, the introductory statement, which is our Father who art in heaven. Now, what is the importance of the Lord's Prayer, or as it is sometimes called, the Our Father in church history? Here's what we find out. Very early in church history, there was a book written that is called the Didache. The Didache includes instructions for Christians, and it was completed very quickly after the New Testament was completed. It is not inspired scripture, but it gives this suggestion that Christians should pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Now that is very telling because the early Christians came from a Jewish background predominantly. And there was a Jewish prayer called the 18 Benedictions that was encouraged for Jews to pray three times a day. And this prayer was considered so important, it is called in antiquity, the prayer. And everybody knew what was being said. The very fact that the Didache encourages Christians to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day conveys that it is holding the Lord's Prayer on the same level as the 18 benedictions, which shows how important it was for them and for the early church. Now this prayer serves two purposes. One is you can pray the prayer straight out, and that is worthy to do on our part. It's a good idea to pray it word for word. There's nothing wrong with that. When we look at the disciples, when we look at Jesus, they would pray scripture prayers from the Bible word for word. And likewise, we can pray the Lord's Prayer word for word. But even more important, the Lord's Prayer gives us instructions on how we should pray. And we're gonna learn some of those principles today. Now, the first two words of the Lord's Prayer, our Father, in the Latin Vulgate are Pater Nastor, and that means our Father. There is an elevator in Europe 
which has been called the Paternast door. And it's a very unusual elevator. It never stops moving. It is on a conveyor belt and it just kind of like just keeps moving around. And people have said the reason they call it the Paternast door is because it's a little dangerous to get on this elevator and you better be praying while you're trying to enter or exit this elevator. But the real reason it was given the name Our Father is because to them, to people who designed it, it was similar to rosary beads in which you're praying through all these prayers which the beads symbolize and that circle is the reflection of the Pater Nestor. I like the image though because I see this elevator perpetually going up, up and up and up. And that is what is ultimately happening when we pray the Lord's Prayer or pray prayers that are reflective of the Lord's Prayer. So what we wanna to do today is anticipate that we're gonna have a learning opportunity from Jesus himself as he teaches us how to pray. Would you pray with me? Father, we have already prayed the Lord's Prayer together. I had the privilege of praying with Michelle. Now, Lord, we want to learn from you what is the significance of these words and how they could add power and significance and worth to the words we pray when we bow our heads, when we kneel, when we're walking along the road and, and just want to talk to you. Father, by your spirit, enlighten us to everything we need to know and hear. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So the word I'm focusing us on today is our Father who art in heaven, or to simplify it, to reflect more of the Greek rendering, our Father in heaven. And what I wanna do is actually move in reverse order. I wanna start with heaven then move to Father and ultimately to Our. And there's a reason for that. So let's start with understanding our God in heaven, our Father in heaven. When we think of God in our culture right now, we are very laid back. He's kind of our pal in the sky. We've lost a sense of transcendence. The fact that God is completely other. You see, the context in which Jesus was teaching was one in which people had a deep and abiding, dare I say it, fear or reverence of God, something which I think is lacking in our culture. If you could picture the people around Mount Sinai where there is fire and thunder and earthquake and, and the idea that Moses is on this mountain and nobody gets near this mountain because God is there. That is the mindset people had of God. And along comes Jesus speaking very intimately of God the Father. To help us understand the transcendence of God, I'd like to use the words of one of Jesus' apostles, the Apostle John. So the last book in our Bible, the book of the Revelation, includes a vision that the Apostle John has of heaven, more specifically, the throne room of heaven. And I'm gonna read through this. I'm not gonna have these words on the screen. I want you to just hear the power of these words as John is somewhat overwhelmed by what he sees when he enters the throne room of heaven. I read these words starting in verse two of Revelation chapter four. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. 
In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like that of a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Now, hearing those words, I want you to imagine what John feels like as he's seeing the actual vision. I think some of the things we pick up is that God at this point seems rather distant. Between him and us is this vast glassy sea. But when we cross that sea, there are these 24 elders and they're, they're clearly of a very high position. They have golden thrones. And, and then as we move further in, there are these four living creatures with these different faces. And, and you're hearing these these voices, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. And the throne itself is surrounded by a rainbow. And a rainbow is not distinct colors. They're, they're fuzzy. And in other words, it's like you can't quite see who's on the throne. And we find out, based on the praise, that this is the creator of all things. If there's anything that this passage conveys to us, is God is far greater than I think we give him credit for. He is truly the great God. And as I look at this passage, I realize our concept of God seems very different. We're, we're very familiar. I think our view of God is very similar to that of the prophet Isaiah. If you look at the first five chapters of Isaiah, he is a court king of the king Uzziah. There is some evidence that Isaiah actually was related to the king. So he probably had a patronage job. He's probably on the court payroll. But then the day came when Uzziah dies. And Isaiah's very familiar feeling with speaking for God, speaking to the king, regularly going into the king's throne room, changes. And this is what we read in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah writes, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, what does he see? High and exalted, seated on his throne, and the train of his garment filled the temple. And there were seraphim, each with six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. At the sound of their voices, the thresholds and the doorposts shook. And Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king. What is happening in that passage is Isaiah moves from a person who's moving rather cavalier into a deep, real understanding of who God is. When we see in this prayer, our God in heaven, I want you to gra grasp for a moment the wonder of this God, the transcendence of this God, the fact that this God is this great, and yet he has come to draw near to you and me. J.I. Packer wrote in his book entitled The Lord's Prayer, something I think is very important. He says, many of us find prayer boring, even dull, because our concept of God has been reduced to something very small. But if you have a vision of the transcendent God, the God who dwells in the heavenlies, 
the God who sits in his throne, surrounded by all these creatures, that at the, the praise of the, the living creatures, the, the elders throw their crowns down. If you see God for who he is, it can bring potency and power to your prayer life. You pray to a dull God, you pray dull prayers. You pray to God for who he actually is, your prayers are transformed because you're catching a glimpse of Almighty God. So we move from our Father in heaven, that was the last word. I now wanna focus on this word, Father. Because once again, what is happening in our passage can meet, um, you can miss what's actually taking place. Let me tell you, in the Old Testament, God is referred to as Father 15 times. And only once could it possibly be being calling God the Father in prayer. It turns out that in the New Testament, God is referred to as Father 245 times. In other words, this is something that Jesus is introducing to the church. God is our Father. That is an intimacy. And it's no wonder that the Apostle John, when he was writing his small epistle of 1 John, in chapter 3, verse 1, he ponders this and celebrates it. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is who we are. That is amazing. And so when Jesus says, let me teach you to pray. And he says, our Father. The crowd that he's speaking to, there is a sense of, ah, I can't believe we can speak to God with that intimacy. Something that you and I take for granted because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, allowing us to go into the very throne room of God, is something because we've lost the sense of the transcendence, we don't have a sense of the power. But when Jesus uses this expression to call God his Father, there is also an understanding that Jesus is somewhat our older brother because we're in the family. And all through the book of John, again, another book written by John, we read that Jesus is waiting on the Father's instruction. He is seeking to follow the Father's direction. He only does what the Father has said. And so when we see this word Father, it is not just a word of intimacy. It is that, but it is more. N.T. Wright, the great British theologian, he puts it this way, and I think his words are helpful. He says, but if we in turn are to be messengers, in other words, students of the Most High God, we need to learn to pray this prayer, the Our Father. We too need to learn what it means to call God Father, like Jesus did. And we mustn't be surprised when we find ourselves startled by what it means. When we find ourselves startled, the one thing you can be sure of with God is that you can't predict what he's going to do next. That is why calling God Father is the great act of faith, of holy boldness and risk. Saying our Father isn't just the boldness, the sheer cheek, of walking into the presence of the living and almighty God and saying, hi, Dad. It is the boldness, the sheer total risk of saying quietly, please, may I too be considered an apprentice son. It means signing on for the kingdom of God. So to acknowledge that God is our Father is not just saying I have an intimacy with the Father, is that I want to be his student. Even as Jesus expressed those words as he interrelated with the Father in prayer. There is a picture, a very famous picture that comes down to us that I think captures both the beauty of intimacy and the transcendence. 
The picture is of John F. Kennedy when he was president. Here's the picture. If you notice, he's in the Oval Office. He's sitting at this beautiful desk. And then underneath him is his son playing. Now, what we have here is a picture of the most powerful human being on the face of the earth, the president of the United States. And you see his son who has complete access to his dad. Both of those must be conceived of in ourselves, that our God is that great, that significant, that holy, that powerful, the creator of the ends of the earth. And simultaneously, he's our Abba, to use the Aramaic. He's our dad. He is our father. But more than just intimacy, by me saying, Father, I'm saying, teach me, Lord, to be your representative as you taught your son, as he, being fully human, recognized his dependence on you. Which brings me now to the last word, which is really the first word in our passage, our, our. The first thing I want you to see is that's a plural. One of the reasons I brought Michelle up here to pray this prayer with me is this prayer by its very nature is something to be shared in community. Does that mean you cannot pray it by yourself? No, it does not. But it does mean that there is a place for God's people, an important place, a place that we should run to, be encouraged to participate in, of that of corporate prayer. That we're in this together. I look to the left and I have a brother. I look to my right and there's a sister there. Which brings me to the next nuance of this. When we see God as our Father, it is not speaking of the fatherhood of all humanity. No, it's speaking of believers. In other words, we have a unique relationship with this great transcendent God. The reason we're here together in a particular church room or in, in a Bible study, and we're all praying together, saying the Our Father, it's an acknowledgement that we are bound together because we both and all of us believe that God is our means of salvation. That is the significance. It is not just a communal relationship one with another, but it is a relationship of this community to the great God. Now, with that in mind, I want you to think and receive something that's really, really important. Together, we see God as one body in all of his greatness with the intimacy of being our Father. And that relationship bears significance. Continuing with N.T. Wright in his book on the Lord's Prayer, he writes these words. When we call God Father, we are called to step out as apprentice children into a world of pain and darkness. Our task is to grow up into our Father, to dare to impersonate our older brother, Jesus, seeking daily bread and daily forgiveness, and as we do so, to wear his clothes, to walk in his shoes, to feast at his table, to weep with him in the garden, to share his suffering, and to know his victory. We began the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, as you ponder that one sentence, see the greatness of God. See that this great God has drawn near and given us the privilege of calling him Father, Abba, Daddy. But understand that when we call him Father, we are aligning ourselves with his purposes. We are his apprentice we are seeking to be more like him. And when I understand the plural, I realize it's not me against the world. It is me with my brothers and my sisters looking to the heavenlies, to our great God and calling him Father.
Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you've given us the privilege of using this word to be able to show our intimacy with you. But we also acknowledge by calling you Father, we are saying you're in charge. We are your children and we will follow where you go. Lord, it is our desire that we together as a people will grow in our understanding of what it means to have an intimate prayer life with you by understanding your greatness and our intimacy with you. May the end result be that your spirit moves us closer to where we need to be at the feet of our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen and amen.